If you're not managing your stress, your stress is managing you. And stress we know makes us stupid, sick, and slow. So if you start meditating, yes, it requires a time investment. But what I am beating the drum of my whole career is that if you get a meditation practice that's designed for you, your return on investment will be exponential. Hi, and welcome. Today I'm talking to someone who I consider a friend and a colleague, the lovely and wonderful Emily Fletcher. Emily is the founder of Ziva Meditation and the Ziva Technique, which teaches a powerful combination of mindfulness, meditation, and my favorite, manifestation. And I'm so excited to have you here to tell everyone how to get better at life. So welcome, Emily. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this. There's a real misconception that meditation means to empty. And I was like, I can't still my mind. I can't empty my mind. Or that it's a deeply spiritual thing only for people who are deeply religious. And if you're busy and you like um, not spiritual things, you can't do meditation. So tell me what is really going on psychologically in your brain and body when you enter meditation. Yeah, so thank you for bringing up that misconception because I feel like the world is filled with ex-meditators or people who feel like they are failed meditators because they couldn't quote unquote clear their mind. And I don't know if this is a product of yoga trainings where people are really focusing on the physical asana practice more than the mental practice, or if it's, I actually think my hypothesis is of now is that everyone is trying to clear their minds because they don't like what their mind is saying. And they're like, well, if I could just shut this thing up, then maybe I could have a moment of reprieve and then I wouldn't be so stressed. So we think, well, if I could stop my mind from thinking, then I will experience bliss, right? Then that's the meditation thing that everyone is saying so good. But it's actually the other way around. It's, it's when I experience bliss, then the mind falls silent. And so this is a, a bit advanced, but we'll just go right out of the gate because I know that your folks can handle it. Um, if you go into a meditation practice with the agenda of trying to clear your mind, you're always gonna feel like you're failing because the mind thinks involuntarily, just like the heart beats involuntarily. However, if you take the time to learn a technique and if you have a tool that's designed for you and not a monk, right? There's monastic meditation, which is more about focusing and discipline and, um, austerity. And what I teach at Ziva, it's all about, like you said, getting better at life, right? So the technique is very gentle. It's very effortless. It feels more like a nap sitting up than anything that is focused or disciplined. The good news is that thoughts are not the enemy at Ziva. And you end up getting so much better at life because you're getting rid of stress from your past. You're actually feeling your body on a cellular level which can increase your IQ, it can increase your performance capabilities, it can decrease your body age, but more importantly, it's giving you more cognitive cycles to do more in less time. So I'd love to talk more about the healing because people think you're either a healer and you're some mystical person or deeply religious and you put your hand on someone's head and say, I heal you, and that may be religious or not, but I think People haven't quite got it that actually healing is self-healing. You're activating within your body its ability to heal itself. After all, if you cut your hand, a wound will heal. You know, when you cut your hand, you make a little scab called fibrin and it heals. But you can we can actually speed up the healing process because of the way we think, because thoughts are things. We know if you think something that's embarrassing, you will blush. If you think of something emotional, you will cry. So you're having an emotional or physical reaction to a thought. But could you talk more about how meditation can really help with healing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So I think there's, there's two different components. So as you said, Ziva is a trifecta of mindfulness, meditation, and manifesting. And for now, I'll speak about how meditation can heal the body. And I'm, you're the expert and the master at how manifesting can help heal the body. But a lot of people, when they hear the word meditation, they think it's just a mental activity, that it's just clearing the mind, which we just talked about. Or, you know, that, that's like a cute bubble bath that I'll get around to when I have more time. And I really want to reframe it as the single most important piece of mental hygiene that we need to be doing every day, because when we clean up our brain, right, like when we change our neurochemistry, we end up changing our biochemistry because every cell in the body is an outpicturing of the mind. 
right? Your mind is responsible for printing every single cell in your body. So if you have the mind of stress, it's very likely that you're going to have the body of stress. And so what we're doing in meditation and specifically in Ziva is that we're de-exciting the nervous system. We're inducing rest that is about five times deeper than sleep. And that is a really important point to underline when we talk about how meditation can impact healing. Because as we all know, if you get sick and you go to the doctor, what are they gonna tell you to do? They're gonna tell you to rest, right? When you give the body the rest that it needs, it knows how to heal itself. And the cool thing here is that with Ziva, we're not just healing stress from the now, we're actually healing all that stress from the past. Everything that we've been accumulating our entire life, that backlog of stresses. Now, a lot of people will ask, well, how can I have stress from the past? Isn't stress a present moment mental phenomenon? But the reality is every single time you've ever launched into fight or flight, it's left an open window on your brain computer. Yeah, so by the time the average adult is 20 years old, we have approximately 10 million of these open windows on the brain computer. They're called premature cognitive commitments. And that is what slows down our brain. It's what slows down our body over time. And so what we're doing with Ziva is we're using a technique to induce very deep healing rest in the body. Again, rest that's five times deeper than sleep. And this is not insignificant because when you give your body the rest that it needs, it knows how to heal itself. So it's like taking this supercharged nap but sitting up and without the sleep hangover and all the while when you're in your with your eyes closed you're going in and closing down those brain windows you're closing down those premature cognitive commitments so that when you come out of the meditation you have more of your mental and physical capacity available to you and this is really the science behind why meditation can make you better at life because i would argue that stress is making us all stupid sick and slow like we've just seen this, right? The whole world has gone under an extraordinary amount of stress and it's, it's made people, I would say, I mean, this is not nice, but it, it's made us a little bit more stupid and that's not meant to be mean. It's just that if your brain is constantly looking for a tiger that might be attacking it, you simply don't have the cognitive capability that would be available to you if you weren't under fight or flight for a long time. So it's really important that we allow the body and brain to feel safe so that we can operate at our highest potential. So something I love is that in Finland, they've given up detention completely and mm. they now only do meditation for children that are acting out. And I know a lot of prison systems are now finding that teaching inmates to meditate instead of locking them in solitary causes them to be calmer, more at ease and better to get on with. And I know you've started Ziva Kids, which is really exciting. A lot of people think, well, how can kids meditate? But I know your, your little boy who's nearly three is already meditating for 22 minutes. So I bet all the mums here want to know, Emily, I can't even get my kid to keep still for five minutes. So could you talk about how children meditate and the benefits of very young children? And then we'll talk about how it helps people in jail and how all schools should be using meditation instead of time out or detention because that just doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't work. It, it actually would make a kid feel like they're a failure or they'll start to identify as a failure or they'll start to identify as, oh, there's something wrong with me or I'm worthy of being punished versus giving them the skills to actually act in accordance with what they know. Like usually when kids or even adults are acting out, it's because we're stressed and it's because something isn't firing properly. So with kids, so Ziva Kids is awesome. I'm so proud of it. I've been working on it for the past two years with folks from Sesame Street and child psychologists from Harvard. And we did that to make it extraordinarily entertaining, right? Like you, we all, any parent who's tried to get their kids to meditate, you can't just say, well, go sit in a corner and close your eyes. Because again, that feels like punishment. That feels like torture. But if you make it fun, if you make it entertaining, and more importantly, if you allow the kid to understand why they, why on earth would they possibly want to do this boring meditation stuff? then they're gonna be much more likely to wanna to do it on their own. And so the way I frame meditation for kids is let's teach it as a superpower, right? Let's teach it as a key that's gonna unlock their own kindness, their own bravery, their own creativity so that they can be better at whatever it is they love doing. So if your kid is really into soccer, be like, okay, well, I know you have a tryout coming up. Let's do Ziva Kids. Let's get your brain and body really primed so that you can nail this soccer tryout. If your kid is really into debate, it's like, you know, what's really going to help you to get into the mind of your opponent is meditation. So rather than approaching it as like, oh, you have anxiety, there's something wrong with you, you need to meditate. 
No, it's like, hey, did you know there's a superpower available to all of us? And it's right inside. And we can do it by having a lot of fun and shaking out our stress, shaking out what I call the stormies. Um, and I also, I think my big goal with Ziva Kids is to empower an entire generation of kids to feel and process their emotions. And I know that you know this from your work, so much of what we deal with as adults is based on unprocessed trauma from our childhood. And so if you give the kids the tools to name and say, and actually physically and mentally process that trauma when and if it's happening, we're gonna be dealing with a much healthier generation of adults in the next generation. Of course, because trauma means the stress that is living in your body. That's what I see trauma as being, that you've had a stressful event maybe 10 years ago, but it's in your body and the body doesn't lie. And many people try to medicate their feelings or shop their feelings or Netflix their feelings or indeed eat or drink or um, use medication for their feelings. But I'm a great believer that you can't heal what you can't feel, but when you can meditate and do any kind of breathing that will allow you to sit with that feeling and understand it and let it go because we all try to push the feelings down i've got a feeling where's the cake i'm having a bad day i need donuts i need candy i need to go on ebay and buy stuff that i don't even, don't even look at because we're trying to get rid of the feeling but i believe that what you're doing is acknowledging the feeling but also letting it go on its own by understanding it yeah that's exactly right and also training uh, our parents, because many of us were raised of like, don't cry, have a bottle. Shh, yeah. Don't cry, have a toy. Shh, don't cry, have an iPad, have some Facebook, have some booze, have some coffee, have some cigarettes, have some pills. And now we have 40% of American adult women are either on anti-anxiety or antidepressants. And this is not an advertisement for don't ever use medication but I don't believe that 40% of adult American women have a Zoloft deficiency. I think that we have not been trained how to identify and process our feelings. And so a big part of Ziva Kids is actually training the parents or yeah. the adults of like, hey, if your kid is having big emotions, great, they're right on schedule. Their prefrontal cortex is not fully developed yet. They need to have temper tantrums. Mm. They need to process this stuff in real time. It's your job as the adult to make yourself emotionally resilient enough to quite literally hold space for them. You don't have to fix it. You don't have to solve it. You just have to be with them, allow them to feel safe enough to truly move through these feelings. And so I'm gonna show you a little prop here. I have, um, so these are the, the stormies and these are the, the puppets that we use to help the kids identify their emotions. And the thing is, it's not just for kids. Like what I'm, what I'm loving is that the adults who are taking the course yeah. are saying, you know what? I'm actually able, as silly as this sounds, I'm able to identify my own emotions and not judge them. And I use the storm clouds because I love that Maya Angelou quote, that every storm runs out of rain. I love the Eckhart Tolle concept that even on a cloudy day, the sun is always shining, right? So even when you're in the thick of it, even when you're in the darkest despair, you still have access to that bliss deep inside of you. And that's what meditation starts to train. It's like, as you breathe into and cultivate that dopamine and serotonin, which are bliss chemicals, we actually paradoxically allow our body to feel safe enough to feel all the stormy emotions. And this phenomenon works for adults and for children. It's just that when you have some fun puppets for kids, it's easier to digest. And I think the earlier that we give people these concepts, the easier it is to, to put them into practice because you're not undoing decades of repression. Yeah, and you know, I always say to my clients, look, your feelings, they're the most real thing you have. Fun and need the size, and you've got to feel them until they no longer require to be felt. And I think so many people who spent say, I'll give you something to cry about in a minute, or don't you cry, or don't you talk back to me, don't show me up, don't have a tantrum. You know, all parents are horrified when their kid flings themselves on the floor in the store and starts, you know, kicking their arms and legs, but they're actually working out of their system immediately. And so it's, I so love that. And if only all parents could know that, I always say look, that your kid is at, it's called acting age appropriate. That's what they do when they're two, and they're age appropriate. They scream. And the first time my daughter had a tantrum, I remember thinking, wow, she's gonna be scarred for life. Half an hour later, she was watching 
the Flintstones, perfectly happy, eating some strawberries, because they just do that. But we're all taught to feel this shame. So the parents feel the shame when their kid acts out. And then they make the kid feel shameful. Oh, if I get angry, you get angry with me for getting angry. So that's really weird. I'm not allowed to get angry, but you are. I'm not allowed to cry. I'm not allowed to be, I'm not even allowed to be miserable because you shout at me and say, turn that frown upside down. And we've got a whole generation who believe that it's not okay to feel and they've got to be happy, happy all the time. So I'm really pleased that you're doing that and explaining. I mean, I do the same thing actually with puppets about feelings and, you know, puppets are so amazing. I worked with a police officer once who said, what's so incredible with children is that when they're abused, they're told, don't tell anyone. If you tell anyone, we'll all go to hell, but they're never taught, don't show. And so you can take a child who's been abused and say, show me where that person touched you. And they won't tell you, but they'll show you. And so I think puppetry working with children is extraordinary. And so how many children have you worked with? How many Ziva kids are there so far? Well, I was teaching live for about 10 years. I would do maybe one or two courses a year. I did not consider myself an expert in teaching kids. So what I did is I went out and I found what I consider to be the world's best experts. I got Dr. Shafali, who's Oprah's parenting awesome. expert. I got, um, like I said, a writer, a puppeteer, and a puppet builder from Sesame Street, and three child psychologists to look at every line and every word to make it both entertaining and really safe. Sure. Um, and so far, we've had about a thousand kids go through the program, and it just came out a few months ago. So how can we find through. it? What's that? Where can our parents who are listening today find Ziva Kids? Yeah, so it's at zivameditation.com slash kids. Okay. So it's Z-I-V-A meditation.com slash kids. And it's cool because it's we are using technology to teach the training, but it's only seven days. Um, again, it's for ages four to 14, but there's two separate courses, one with the puppets for the four to eight-year-olds, and then one that's a little bit more science-based where I talk about, you know, Ariana Grande and Steph Curry and all the TikTok stars for the, for the teens so that they know that actually the cool kids already are meditating. Uh, and it's the point of the story is that once they, your kid moves through those seven days of training, they're going to have these tools to take with them for life. So they, don't, they won't be tech dependent for their meditation practice. And do you plan to have that in schools? Are you going to take it into schools and maybe- I, From your lips to God's ears, like we're working on that right now. I would love to see this go as wide as possible. We actually have a bunch of investors, not a bunch, we have like three big time investors who would like to start a foundation to get this into marginalized communities, underfunded schools. And that would be my dream. Um, but I would, I'm, so if anybody has, a school group, a superintendent, like let's let's go, like let's get this thing into the hands of as many children as possible. Yeah, and I think you will, because we've now got RTT into schools, and it's just you only have to get one. You get one school, one pilot group, and then you get one more. And I love Dr. Shivali; I think she's amazing. So I, I feel that's going to happen for you very fast. Then you'll have the snowball effect, and it will be rather like in Finland. Every school will have meditation and indeed mindfulness instead of detention. So another question is people talk about this going into the gap and they get very confused about I must go into the gap. What does that mean to you going into the gap? Well, I think that there's two ways that people use that term. I actually have a chapter in my book called Mind the Gap. And that's really about the space between the stimulus and the response. And that to me is a benefit and a byproduct of a daily meditation practice. Like you're getting to the chair every day, twice a day. And then you know you get some quote unquote bad news or somebody cuts you off in traffic and rather than involuntarily launching into a fight or flight stress reaction that you don't have much control over because when the amygdala takes over your executive function shuts down and then we make mistakes we sleep with the person we eat the cookie we punch the guy and then we're cleaning up our messes all day um, that's not where we want to be so that's one usage of mind the gap is basically meditation elongating the space between stimulus and response but I think what you're referring to is actually what I would call the bliss field. Mm -hmm. And it's that beautiful state of consciousness where you're in between waking and sleeping. You're not quite awake or you're not quite asleep. And it's a verifiable fourth state of consciousness. It's different than waking, different than sleeping, and it's even different than dreaming. And when you, when you hook your a brain up to an EEG machine, which is electroencephalography hardware, uh, there's eight classic points on the right brain and eight classic points on the left. 
And in waking, sleeping, and even dreaming states of consciousness, right and left brains are functioning separately. But when we go into this gap and we go into what I call the bliss field, all 16 leads of EEG rise and fall in unison, which I think is a pretty cool party trick that you sitting in a chair and doing a technique could actually change your brain signature. But a lot of people are like, why does that matter? Why would I care? Well, everyone should because your right brain, and, and I know this is an oversimplification, but let's call it, oh, we'll just go right brain, left brain. I'm sure that your folks can, can translate, but right brain is more creative and intuitive and connected and also color. And then our left brain is, you know, math, navigation, logistics, past, future. And we really want the brain to be functioning on all cylinders. So now what we found is that you, when you start to access this other state of consciousness, you thicken something called the corpus callosum, which is the bridge between the right and left hemispheres of the brain. And we've known for a long time that meditators have thicker corpus callosums than non-meditators, but we weren't able to prove that that was causal or correlated. But now we know that the longer we meditate, the thicker the corpus callosum becomes, which is again, a cool party trick, but why would I care? Well, my hypothesis is that the thicker your corpus callosum is, the easier it is for you to be in the middle of a high demand situation, but still have access to that creative problem solving capability. To be in the fight with your partner and instead of retreating to the bedroom and three hours later coming up with the witty comeback, you can come up with the comeback in real time. You can come up with the idea with your boss even when they're yelling at you. Um, so it's, I think that it's a, a lofty goal. It's not even lofty. It's actually what nature designed. Right? It's how our brains are designed to work. It's just that most of us have been spending the majority of our time stressed out exclusively in our left brain, exclusively functioning from a place of individuality. And when we start to dive into that gap and we start to let the right and left hemispheres of the brain dance together, we have this simultaneity of individuality and totality of self and universal intelligence. And this is really where the magic happens, is where you start to feel like you're in flow state, it's where the ideas start coming to you. Um, life just feels a lot more elegant and effortless. But the thing that I wanna highlight is that going into the gap, it can, that can be confused with the goal of meditation. And that's where the misnomer of like, well, let me clear my mind, I think messes a lot of people up. So if you sit down and meditate, and you're like, well, let me get into the gap. Let me clear my mind. Let me change my state of consciousness. You're then using effort and control, which is antithetical to the technique itself. And do you find people too, because I find that they're so busy trying to be, I've got to be perfect at it. They're so busy wanting to be perfect at meditation. that They kind of miss the point of the meditation that you don't have to be perfect at it. You don't have to be good at it. You just have to practice it because in practicing it, you become good enough at it to get all the benefits. But what would you say about people who believe that you must be perfect? You must like have an empty mind and sit and look at a candle and chant on and go into the gap for half an hour and, and, and give it up because they can't do it. Yeah, I think this is a really important point. I actually dedicated my book to anyone who's, who feels like a meditation failure. I say, you're not a failure. You just haven't been taught yet. And so while I do want to give people a lot of freedom, and I, and I think what people love about my teaching is that they say I give them so many permission slips that they don't have to be in the gap. They don't have to sit with fancy fingers. They don't have to have a perfectly erect spine. They don't have to clear their minds. And yet I do want to really highlight that meditation is a skill. Hmm. Just because it's simple does not mean that it's easy. Like none of us would start a 21 day Japanese challenge tomorrow if we had never taken a Japanese class. We would not expect ourselves to speak Japanese for 20, for 20 minutes a day if we had never first learned the language. And yet this is what most people are doing with meditation. They're like, well, somebody told me to clear my mind, so I'm gonna sit in this chair and I'm gonna try and clear my mind. And, and actually, that's why so many people feel like failures. And many actually meditation just begin with that. They say, get yourself comfortable now, empty your mind. Go, I can't do that. I failed, I failed at the first hurdle because I cannot get my mind. Empty. They don't understand that the human mind is not actually designed to be emptied. You can be having a massage and totally blissed out. You're still thinking about I need to charge my phone and I've got enough money on the meter. I'm going to pick up some nice fish for dinner tonight. So it, it's a shame that people fail because of the instructions given, not by you, that begin with now, empty your mind, which people say, well, I, how do I even do that? 
A lot of things that say relax is I don't even know how to relax. Of course we do, but it's great that you're bringing it to the masses and you're making it easy, you're making it simple, you're making it fun, but you're also explaining that the mind is not even designed to be empty. Even when you're sleeping, your mind, I mean, the subconscious mind is always switched on and it's also always on record. You can't empty that because it, it's like, you know, as a mother, you can sleep through a car backfiring in the street Probably in New York, you can sleep through police sirens, but your baby makes a little snuffle and you wake up immediately because the mind is not designed to do that. Yeah. And, and even in a coma, you're still thinking. And I have so many people in my groups, they'd be like, well, meditation this morning was so active. I was having so many thoughts. And I'm like, good. That means you're not dead. Like okay. Thoughts are not the enemy of meditation. Effort is. And I'm so and, glad you said that because that's, yeah. say that again, because I love that. Yeah, so thoughts are not the enemy of meditation, effort is. And the more you're efforting to be a good meditator, likely the more you're going to feel like you're failing. Because so I would say, it is a skill, right? But once you have a technique that's made for you and not a monk, mm -hmm. and once you have a bit of practice with it, yes, it's ridiculously simple. Yes, you're going to see a return on investment, but we, what we have got to let go of is this idea that we should magically already know how to do it. Yeah. Um, and that this idea, like you said, that we should be able to clear our minds because that, that day is never coming until we die. Yeah, and I, then, know. I don't know. <laughs> I know the first time I tried Pilates, I felt a kind of rage towards my poor Pilates teacher because it's like, okay, make your zip up. You've got to zip something up and hold your stomach like a V and all the ropes. And, and it was just so confusing. But then it's a bit like also learning to drive a car or operate machinery or even indeed operate your computer. It all comes to you. The more you do it, the easier it is, the easier it is, the more you do it. So I love the fact that you're making it easy and, and making people realize that you can't fail at meditation. The only way you can fail at it is not doing it. I would say, well, look, the word trying is very trying. Trying is trying. Yeah. And if you try it, you can't fail at it. You just have to keep going rather like riding a bike or swimming until it becomes effortless. But it's, mm -hmm. nobody just gets in the pool and swims. Nobody just gets on a bike. You fall off a bit and then you learn it. So I love that. But I also love your story because, of course, you were a dancer and I used to teach dance. So I feel, our, and now you, you teach meditation. I teach hypnosis. I feel our worlds are very parallel in many ways. But I'd love you to share your story. What took you from where you were to meditation? Where did it begin? What, what was the thing that led you to meditation? What's mm -hmm. been the catalyst for your work? And, and what's your fascination? Where did you get that fascination with meditation from? Because I know you can only ever be truly good at something if you love it. And you're such an example of that. You love it and you're good at it and you're good at it and you love it. And you make it look easy. Well, I think meditation can be easy, but I would say that my story, I was just telling the story this weekend to a coach of mine. And I, I realized that when I was five years old, I asked my mom, because uh, I was raised Southern Baptist in the South of the U.S. And, um, and I asked my mom, I was like, how do, you, how do we know we're Baptist? And she's like, what? I'm five, by the way. And she, I was like, were we born Baptist? Or did we choose to be Baptist? And like, how do we know we're not Buddhist or Muslim or Jewish? And so at five years old, my mom let me go and visit all the different churches and temples and synagogues in Tallahassee, Florida. Now, granted, there wasn't a huge diversity, but she still let me try out a bunch of different things. And so what I realized at a pretty early age is that God is a disco ball and we're all looking at the same thing, but you see purple and you see green and you see red. And we're all having perhaps a, a slight variation on an experience, but we're all really looking at this same unifying force, right? That this, this divine animation inside of us really is in all of us. And how we get there um, is, is a personal preference. And I love this quote, if you're arguing about what the face of God looks like, chances are you haven't seen it, right? That that thing is just really omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient. And I think I've, I've, felt that intuitively my whole life. And then I think I, I got entranced by the performing arts. I spent 10 years on Broadway singing and dancing and acting, and it was amazing. Uh, but even then, my, my first Broadway show, once I achieved this lifelong goal, it was the saddest I had ever been. 
And so I learned at a pretty young age that I was more interested in the happiness of pursuit than I was the pursuit of happiness. And so I just kept looking, 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 but then finally I found meditation and it cured my insomnia. I, had, I hadn't been able to sleep through the night for 18 months. I had been going gray. Uh, at 26 years old, I was going gray. I was getting sick and injured. And it was confusing as to why I was living my dream on Broadway and miserable. And so finally, when I found meditation, it cured my insomnia on the first day of the first class. I stopped going gray. I didn't get sick for eight and a half years. I started enjoying my job again. And I just thought, why is the whole world not doing this? So I left Broadway. I went to India. I started what became a three-year training process to teach. And then since graduating 10 years ago, um, we created the world's first online meditation training, which I'm really proud of. The book has now been translated into 14 different languages. And it's fun to be in the space at a time where people are really waking up to meditation. Like it's hard to believe that even seven years ago, there was no headspace, there was no calm, there was no Oprah Chopra. It was a really different landscape then. And now meditation is so cool, it's so popular. And now the challenge really is how do we educate people on the difference between a free app and you yourself having your own meditation practice that you don't need to go to your phone in order to meditate. Because to me, meditating with your phone is like having an AA meeting in a liquor store. It's like, why would you go in the belly of the beast to disconnect? Yeah, um, and so now what I'm interested in is, is like, what's next? I'm really excited about this new world that we're entering, this new chapter, and figuring out ways to help people awaken their own energy and connect with their own divinity in the most powerful ways possible. And, and it feels like an exciting like rebirth for me and also for the world. And I'm excited for myself to figure out well, how, which of my tools now are most relevant to the world. And to pose that question to my students as well. Like you are a different human than you were two years ago. The world is a different place than it was two years ago. And so how, how can we use our most mm, relevant tools to solve the new challenges that we're facing as a species? So you were living the dream. I mean, being a dancer on Broadway, that is the dream for many girls. It's like, I want to be a dancer, but a dancer on Broadway, I believe you're in 42nd Street, which I absolutely, I love. I took my daughter to see that. I still love all, all the songs. I can remember all of those. But here's the thing, because many of you are living the dream. You know, you were doing a job that's physical, all those end offs are charging around your body when you're dancing on stage. Obviously you look really hot because you're a dancer, you're lithe and lean and all our everyday issues, like I can't lose 10 pounds, I hate my job. You didn't have any of that. So that's so interesting for our audience that having your dream job, probably a dream body, living in New York, you still had this tremendous stress and you couldn't sleep through the night. So can you talk more about that? Because most people say, well, I'm stressed because I hate my job. I'm stressed because I don't like the way I look. I'm stressed because I haven't got what I want, but you had what you wanted, what you really, really wanted. Yeah. And I see that so with lots of rock stars. I'd love you to talk about what that is like having what you having the dream and being stressed, because we think you're stressed because you haven't got the dream. Yeah. But what happens when you've got the dream and having the dream causes you stress? Well, I really appreciate you highlighting this because I, I see it as one of the great blessings of my life. Mm. The fact that I was able to achieve my childhood dream at such an early age so that I could demolish the illusion mm. of what I call the I'll be happy when syndrome. Sure. If had it taken me to 40 or 50 or 60 to achieve this dream, I would have, I mean, if I know myself well enough, I wanted it so badly and I was so passionate about it that I likely could have stayed in that story. I could have stayed in that lie for many more decades and thought that there really was a pot of gold at the end of the Broadway rainbow. And I know so many people are in that. If I could just make another million dollars, if I could just find the right person, if I could just have the baby, if I could just have a million followers on Instagram, then I will be happy. Mm. And, and a lot of people do that to the grave. They're just chasing, chasing what's next, what's next, what's next. And so the reason why I consider having, you know, achieving this goal at such an early age, a blessing was not because of the bliss that it provided me because it didn't. As I said, three weeks after I got my Broadway show was the saddest I had ever been. Can I ask you why? Why was yeah. it sad? Because it felt like my goal had been taken away from me. The thing that I was focused on was 
was really the like, well, let's get on Broadway. Yeah. And then once I got on Broadway, it wasn't Sunshine and Roses. I still had insomnia. You know, I thought it was going to be martinis with Liza at Sardi's, but mm. instead it was girls eating tuna fish out of a can and complaining about their bunions backstage. Mm. Like I, it was still real life. Mm. I still didn't know, you know, how I was going to pay my rent or who I was going to date or, you know, it was still the real problems of being a human. And because I had fantasized it, you know, I had said, well, you know, I think all my problems will go away once I achieve this dream. And so once I achieved it and life wasn't perfect, it was devastating to me mm. because I was mourning um, basically the whole ideology that I had been operating in since I was in fourth grade. And so then it left me looking for, well, if this, if Broadway didn't make me happy, then where is it? Like, where do we find happiness? And, yeah. and it took me 10 years, okay? It took me 10 years from getting on Broadway to finding meditation, but I finally found it. And in those 10 years, I would pride myself on being a seeker. But I was like, well, it's this therapy, it's this book, it's this new self-help, it's this diet, it's this supplement. And I was a seeker. I was looking for the happiness everywhere. But then once I found this style of meditation, I was like, oh, I found it. And it's right inside of me. And it's what we all know intuitively. Our happiness exists in one place and that is inside of us. It exists in one time and that is right effing now. But it is very hard to really relax into that or to enjoy that viscerally unless you have a daily connection with the divine. I find it through meditation. Some people find it through prayer or ecstatic movement. You know, some people even find their way through sex or psychedelics. And I'm not one to, you know, whatever your way to God is, if that's your way. It's just that there's so many scientifically proven benefits around meditation that it's like this thing is going to keep making you smarter, faster, hotter, healthier, and oh yeah, happier the longer you practice yeah. it. And I say that, I say, you know, I'm, I'm going to be happy when, when my kid can feed themselves, when my kid, because when I have a kid, when I have love, when I've got a house and I said, there's no destination you're going to arrive at called happiness. There is no terminal called happiness. Happiness is where you are now. It's the journey you're on. Happiness is an inside of, you want to be happy. You have to start to go, I'm happy now. I'm ha I wake up every day and the first thing I say is I love my life. I have a little song. I sing it. I love my daughter. I love my cats. Getting I love hanging out with my daughter. I just, I always decide I love my life and it, you can never add to it when, but I'd love it more if I was five pounds lighter, five years younger, um, could um, do uh, the plank. I'd love it more if I could do the splits or if, and we're, we're always adding to, I'll be happy when, and there is no, you can't quantify happiness. I see so many parents go, wow, I wasted my whole baby's babyhood wishing it away. I'll be happier when. Whereas for me, when I had a baby, I actually wished every stage took three times as long. It went. Yes, yeah, me too. And I wish they could be a newborn for three years and a little toddler because it went so fast. And But I was very lucky to really enjoy every moment, to just be in it. Because otherwise you end up waste, wishing it away. And then you look back and think, wow. Look at me when I was 18, I thought I was hideous. I was like the hottest thing. Look at me, I thought I was fat, I was amazing. Yeah. We waste so much of our youth wishing for it to be perfect. And I think social media has made that a million times worse because now we get so exposed to other people are having a perfect life on Instagram, but it's not real. Or having a perfect life on YouTube, but it's not real. And I'm so glad that your teacher, but look, you know, if you want to be happy, so I said, if you want to have a perfect body, love the body you've got. That's how to get, but love the body you have with all its flaws. And then you start to feel so much better when people say, oh, I'm getting old. I'm like, well, it's better than the alternative. It's a great thing to get old because what's the other alternative? Don't get old. It's a blessing to get old. It's a blessing to have stretch marks. It's a blessing because it means you've lived a life. I used to look, my grandmother, I said, she had like lines, and I, they were like lace. I used to trace all the lines on her face. I thought they was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen, whereas I had a very glamorous, quite beautiful mother, but she was never beautiful to me because she was always on a diet, always stressed. My gran would make cakes and pies, and she was a typical fat granny, but she was, to me, she was just the epitome of absolutely, she was like an angel because she lived in the moment. And... Mm -hmm. I think we should all be learning that 
you, the, the moment is all you've got. And if you can't enjoy the moment and you're always waiting to be happy, like you see people at the airport, when we, when we arrive, I'll be happy. When we've checked in, when I've unpacked. But, you know, for kids, everything's an adventure. They find a puddle, it's an adventure. They find a worm or a spider or a bee, it's an adventure. And they, they're really such a lesson in living in the now, which I guess is, is probably another word for the gap. So, Emily, when would you say you have most needed in your entire life? When have you most needed to meditate? And when has it been the most beneficial to you? Hmm. It's such an interesting question because I am so with you on everything you just said, except for my first month postpartum was a nightmare. Like it was a nightmare. I had a dream pregnancy. I have savored every second of every minute of every day. I get to experience with this angel human. And I, I really am very proud of the fact that I've been present and enjoying it. But that first month, we had a lot of physical complications and it was physically painful. And I just felt like I was in a battle zone. Mm. And, and interestingly, I think that that is the time that I needed meditation the most. And I did not meditate one time for a whole month after the baby was born. And so I'm sharing that for a few reasons. Like one, people are going to miss days. You know, it's not about being a perfect meditator. And to me, it was like I was putting deposits in the bank account for 10 years or whatever. I'd been meditating at that time for like the high demand situations. It's like, I, so that was a time where I could pull some withdrawals. From my account, um, meaning that I, my body was at a certain level of strength. I had been resting through the pregnancy. And then I went to this really intensive time where I could have used meditation, but if I had 20 minutes, my body would just fall asleep. Um, and so that's likely where I needed it the most. And I didn't even meditate once for a whole month. And then I just slowly but surely once a day, okay, it'll be 10 minutes here, you know, just little catch as catch can until I got back to my regular program. But I would say after that, it would be going through the pandemic. You know, I live in, in Brooklyn, in New York, and it was also, so we were sort of the epicenter of the US, um, you know, like the first wave of the virus, but then we were also at the epicenter of the protests that were happening. And I, you know, regardless of where you sit on that, that issue, I am, it was very intense to be here. Like there was constant sirens and helicopters and horns and yelling. And so we were many months into a pandemic. All of my friends left New York City. I couldn't teach, you know, the whole world was changing. And then it felt like I was in the middle of a war zone, like pretty much 20 to 23 hours a day. And so it, it was like, oh, I felt like a low grade anxiety for the first time in my life. I even had like what felt like maybe a borderline panic attack. And I was like, is this what this feels like? And it gave me such a level of empathy because I thankfully don't experience that very often. And so that I would say the meditation really helped me to adapt to the changing world, adapt to my changing business, adapt to my changing friend structure. And also my personal life was doing a total 180. And so had I not had that bedrock of here and now, here and now, I think it, it likely would have been a lot more challenging than it was. Yeah, you kind of realize when challenging things, because nobody would have imagined this pandemic would be, you, we realize how lucky we are. We've got these tools because, you know, life isn't perfect. But when you have a little tool that you can use, it, it just makes your life so much better. I'm always amazed at how tribes live in that they, they spend a huge amount of time doing nothing. You know, we think they're always working, but they're not. The minute it's dark at five o'clock, they sit around the campfire. You can't do anything without, with, without electricity. And although they're quite active, they're rather like my cats. My cats hunt. Well, not much. I don't want them to hunt, but they do. They play, they climb trees. But they spend so much time just lying down, sleeping. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what, why we've, we've sort of moved away from this. You're a human being, not a human doing. That means you should just be, sit and look at the stars, look in the metaphorical campfire. Um, do nothing and yet we have so much guilt oh I, I, I'm wasting time I'm wasting I need to be productive I need to be seen to do something how how do you think we've lost that 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 ancestral ability to spend time doing nothing I think a lot of it has to do with exactly what you said of electricity you're living in a post agricultural post electricity world and if you think, if you, if you were to live with no electricity or no heat or no air conditioning mm. for a month, 
you would likely change your productivity habits quite a bit. Sun goes down, you have candlelight for a little while, but the candle or the firewood is going to burn out eventually. So you make dinner, you eat dinner, you maybe tell a few stories and then you go to sleep. And we usually used to sleep in polyphasic cycles. So we would go to bed relatively early, wake up usually around two or three, which is when the liver kicks in. And you would have about an hour or two of just, they would call it the watch. Like in Elizabethan literature, they call it the watch. We're not quite awake, you're not quite asleep. You might have sex, you might have a bit of a salon, but it's really sort of lounging. And in that watch, we're in a very similar state of consciousness as we are when we're in meditation. But now in this post-electricity, post-agricultural world, we now can keep the lights on until 10 o'clock. We can turn the lights on. We can turn on air conditioning so we don't have to take a siesta in the middle of the day. And so we've just squished our sleep into this seven or eight hour cycle, which is actually not that, it's not that great for us. Um, naps and, and polyphasic sleeping is what Michelangelo used to do. It's what Da Vinci used to do. It's what um, I think Einstein did as well. Don't quote me on that. Um, but basically some of our greatest artists and greatest thinkers would sort of be on and off in and out of these different states of consciousness throughout a 24 hour day cycle. Um, and so a lot of it I think has to do with electricity. And then, and now we add on top of that technology. Yeah. And so we're being constantly fed, not only everyone else in our world's successes. So we're now comparing our worst day against someone else's Instagram curated successful life but we're also being fed all of the tragedies and dangers around the world within a 30 second scroll through the news. And it is not natural for humans to have access to that much information. We simply have not evolved to process that amount of information in that short amount of time. And I think that we're, we're realizing the long-term ramifications of trying to force our brains to process more information than we were designed for. And, and it's really like, for what? like maybe pick one cause, right? Pick one travesty in the world, dedicate yourself to that. But to try and consume all of the tragedy simultaneously, you're really only stressing yourself out. Yeah, and I was in, I won't say which country, but I was in a country, a very modern country, and I was really shocked to see all the strollers had iPads in them when you bought them. So you could have a little baby of 10 months old facing away from the mother, doing this as they walked down the promenade using a screen and um, it's extraordinary that, you know, I see, I see that a lot where you're at a lunch or a dinner and the parent gives their kid their phone to play with, to occupy them. But now they all have their own phones and they're also, I mean, we're on our phones and people sleep with their phone under the bed and when it pings, they wake up to see what the message is or they look at their phone when they wake up at night. And it is, as you say, it's this overload of overloading our minds, which are designed to be in a cycle. There's a cycle of sleep, a cycle of awake, a cycle of relaxing. And, and I think our minds have got into this constant cycle of being stimulated all the time. And I really think we're going to pay a really extraordinary price for that, which leads me on to my next question, which is why do you think we've separated the mind from the body? Like, you know, when I, again, when I'm at the tribe, they'll say, well, that, that leaf does this and that plant does that. And they're they're very connected to nature. And I remember the first time I was in Africa, they were saying, wow, Western people eat so much because they only eat three varieties of food at a meal. And you and I know that when you have a lot of variety, it stimulates your appetite and you eat more. And then of course, electricity helps with that too, because you've always got, you can open the fridge and the freezer and there's so much variety, which you wouldn't have if you were living in a little hut in the middle of the Serengeti. But why do you think we've now separated the mind and the body that we think they're separate? I'm, I'm ill, it's my body. I'm, I've got uh, irritable bowel or stomach upsets or headaches or backaches. And we've decided it's just purely physical and haven't ever looked at the mental connection. I think that, and, and I'm just hypothesizing here, but the thing that's coming up for me is that it's twofold. One likely has to do with trauma or any sort of abuse. I think physical abuse, certainly sexual abuse. I feel, and you probably know this better than anyone, but if you're sexually abused, a survival mechanism is to separate your body and your mind. Well, this is happening to my body, but I'm safe and having a separate experience in my mind. Yeah. And now we know that one in four, we used to say women, but now we're starting to realize that it's actually one in four humans are likely dealing with some sort of sexual abuse. That could be a big piece of it. But even if it's not sexual trauma, 
any sort of physical trauma or an alcoholic household, like if your body doesn't feel physically safe, I think it's quite natural as a survival mechanism to be like, well, here's my mind and here's my body. So that's one piece of it, which is again, a hypothesis. But the second piece is certainly with Western medicine, you know, we know that our brains will follow where a vocabulary takes us. Like if you're in Russia, there's 14 words for the color blue. And so Russians can see more shades of blue. And so our, our minds will adapt to form with the language that we have. And because allopathic Western medicine, you know, we have a heart specialist, we have a bone specialist, we have a skin specialist, we have a brain specialist, but they're all looking at their own piece of the puzzle. And it's not until very recently that we even had the field of functional medicine that's looking at the holistic system. Mm -hmm. How's your stress? How's your diet? How's your body? And I think that that's really going to be the wave of medicine for the future, because just to try and extrapolate, certainly you could specialize in one of the things, but I think that the specialization really should only happen after we've looked at the holistic picture. And it is nice that now certain doctors are saying you need meditation, you need a relaxation technique. You're, you're not depressed, you're actually overstressed, overstimulated. And so I love the fact that a lot of medicine is now trying to take us back to chill, breathe, meditate, relax, go for a walk. I could give you pills, but pills are not the answer. The answer is to get you away from your mind. So what advice do you have for people who are new to meditation? Because I think everyone here today is thinking, well, if, gosh, if I can look younger, I'm, I'm going for it. So what advice would you give to somebody who's new to it and really wants to do it, but again, is in that, I've got to be perfect at it. I don't have the time. I, have, I haven't got the time to meditate, what would you say? Yeah. How do they start and how do they keep it going? So I'd say, you know, we covered the first obstacle, which is, you know, this a clear my mind myth. Mm -hmm. So that one, I feel like people get your mind thinks involuntarily, just like your heart beats involuntarily. So know that you're not a failure if you can't clear your mind. That's a really important piece of advice for people starting. The second piece of I don't have time to meditate. The question is, okay, do you have time to be stupid, sick and slow? because that is the reality. If you are not managing your stress, your stress is managing you. And even if you had therapists for parents, an organic vegetable garden in your yard and never had an ill experience in your whole life, just being a human being on planet earth right now, like, oh, PS, we all just went through a pandemic and are going through a pandemic. Like there are things that we're being asked to adapt to as humans that are weighing down on our minds and bodies. So. If you're not managing your stress, your stress is managing you. And stress we know makes us stupid, sick, and slow. So if you start meditating, yes, it requires a time investment. But what I am beating the drum of my whole career is that if you get a meditation practice that's designed for you, your return on investment will be exponential. So what does that mean? For a 15 minute meditation investment, you will get back hours of joy, productivity, presence, and play in your day. And that's just, I mean, that has been scientifically proven. I have 50,000 students who will say the thing, you know, our friend Mark Hyman, who mm. is the head of the Cleveland Clinic for Functional Medicine, he's a Ziva graduate. He brought me to bring his whole team of doctors to meditate. And he says, I don't have time not to meditate. Cool. And that's really hard to convince someone who feels overwhelmed and stressed of. And the only thing I can say is if Oprah has time to meditate, you have time to meditate, but it's hard to imagine what it would feel like to make faster decisions, to have more efficient sleep, to get sick less often, and to be more creative if you don't have a visceral experience of that yet, but it's possible. And let's talk a little bit about looking younger because that may be the, the tipping thing. Okay, I'm gonna do it for that because a lot of people spend a lot, 10 minutes a day doing the cleanse, tones, moisturize, tapping. You know, we have 16 layers of skin. You can't really get those products to go down to 16 layers, but that's a good switch. Instead of spending all that time exploring and money, and money huge amount of money. Um, what, how can meditation make us look younger? Yeah, so I'm 86 years old and looking great. Um, no, I'm 42, I just turned 42 and I feel like I am actually stronger and I like my body more and I feel like more attractive than I felt in my late 20s when I was dancing on Broadway eight shows a week. 
And that is, I mean, yes, a product of being active and, and strengthening my body, but also hugely because of meditation. Um, so here's the science though, on what can happen here. Meditation has now been scientifically proven to reverse your body age by somewhere between eight to 14 years. And actually one of these studies I learned from you, one of them is from Wake Forest University. The other one is from Tufts University. And I can't remember which one is saying which, but basically what's happening is when we're stressed, our telomeres, which are like the little casing at the end of our DNA strand, the stress over time shortens and weakens those telomeres. And if you think about telomeres, like the casing, the little plastic wrap at the end of your shoestring, if the plastic casing comes unraveled, then the shoestring un unravels faster. And that's what happens to our DNA. When we get stressed, those telomere casings shorten and weaken, and then our DNA strand unravels. And our DNA is directly correspondent to our, our body age and our death date. So we wanna keep those telomeres strong. And one way to do that is by reducing our stress. And meditation is the single most powerful stress relieving tool that we have. So it's not magic, it's just a return on investment. If you're investing your time every day of reducing your stress, you're gonna strengthen and lengthen your telomeres. Now, also when we get stressed, the body has to protect itself from predatory attacks. And one of its protection mechanisms is releasing acid onto the skin so that we don't taste very good if we get bitten into by the predator. And over time, that chronic acidity on our skin can prematurely age us. Whereas what happens conversely when we start meditating is we flood our brain and body with dopamine and serotonin, which are bliss chemicals, which feel nice, but they're also alkaline in nature. So because we ha now have the brain of bliss, we soon have the body of bliss. So our skin becomes more alkaline. And this is one of the things that we can reverse our body age on the, on the physical level. Uh, and then the other thing is that we're, we're increasing our neuroplasticity, which is the brain's ability to change itself, but we're also increasing neurogenesis, which is the brain's ability to generate new brain cells. And we used to think that that stopped at 24, and then it was just a slow decline to the grave, but that is not true. You can actually continue neurogenesis up until your 80s if you are eating the right foods, exercising, having sex, time in nature and meditation. We have to have all pieces of the pie, but you know we're meant to be evolving and creating as humans. This idea of like, oh, your brain is fully formed in your twenties and then you just rot to the grave. This is not how humans are designed. No, I know, We've been in many, I've been in many blue zones with you where they have the oldest, I think we were in Sardinia together and we saw that and in um, Santorini too, where people have all those steps to walk up and that's that, that, there's a lot of things that keep you young. One of them is activity, but the, of course the, the, a huge thing is joy, being part of a community and feeling connected and feeling significant and feeling that you matter. So I've loved talking to you and I could actually talk to you for at least another hour, but I really need to ask you, what are your three top tips? Yeah, so I mean, the first and obvious one is, is meditate. And, and I wanna just, we've been talking about that for an hour, but I wanna qualify it a little bit. If for you, meditation means sitting down for 10 minutes and feeling like a failure and torturing yourself, stop doing that. Like stop immediately, it's not worth it, okay? It's a waste of your time and none of us have time to waste. And, and even if for you, if you're like, well, I downloaded an app and I did it a few times, but I didn't really see a return on investment, I would just invite you to be curious and to perhaps try another style where you start to see like, oh, for 15 minutes invested, my whole life gets better. So even if you've written off meditation, I want to invite people to be curious and, and really learn the technique, see if it fits in your life, see if it doesn't make your life better. So that's number one is for sure meditation. The other one that I've started doing about a year and a half ago is something called design your day. And I'm in this group of like eight witches and we, every six weeks we, we have a game. And so we partner up of the eight women's so we're two by two and we'll do something called design your day. And you have to send it to your partner by 10 AM. What I do is I write out my day in past tense first thing in the morning. My interview with Marissa was amazing. We loved reconnecting and inspired so many people to meditate. My time with my son was so fun and present. I had some magical school reach out about bringing Ziva kids to the school. You know, my team was happy and hit all their goals and I was in bed by midnight. So, you know, I'm writing it out in past tense, but first thing in the morning and I'm sending it to my partner. And then before I go to sleep at night, I have to report back. Yes, the interview with Marissa was amazing. My time with Jasper was awesome. Didn't get that school today, but I bet it's coming tomorrow. 
So it's it's manifesting, but it's doing it in the written form. It's doing it with a buddy and it's doing it with accountability. So I know that's kind of more than a tip. It's it's kind of, um, you know, it's pretty good though, because you're setting an intention with an accountability body. And if you have an accountability partner, your chance of succeeding goes up by amazingly 80%. So you're setting an intention with someone who's holding you accountable. And that's an amazing tip. I think everybody could think, you know, if you're going to take a tip, definitely take that one because science has proven that really, really works. So what's your third tip, your very last tip? Yeah. And third tip, hmm, without going like the obvious exercise route, I would say it would be around like joy and pleasure. Yeah. Like I used to, you know, I've been so driven and so like success oriented my whole life that I would almost use meditation a bit as a drug of like, okay, well, let me take this 20 minutes to recharge and get more energy so that I can just get back to work. And I'm not proud of that, but I, I recognize that I've done that in chapters of my life. And I feel like right now I'm really shifting that and I'm making more space for pleasure, more space for joy, because really that's what it's all about. Like that's really why we're here on the planet. And paradoxically, the better you feel, the happier you are, the more pleasure you have in your heart and body, we can't help but manifest higher quality things. And I think I just got that backwards for a lot of my life. And so I'm, I'm cultivating time, like set time with my friends, with myself, with God to just marinate in joy and pleasure. And it's been really fun. Yeah, I think marinating in joy and pleasure is a great thing to do. So like I see you know, they, even when sex is all rushed, so it's, even that's a rush. And you re, it's, again, it's that be, be a human being, just be, be in the moment, be in the moment when you're having your first tea or coffee and really enjoy it be in the moment when you're having sex with your partner and don't think about other things be in the moment even when you're having a bath or whatever you're doing if you can just stop and be in the wow this is the most I, I get excited every day about my first cup of tea my husband brings me, always brings me tea in bed I always have English breakfast with a bit of oat milk and every day I think well this is the yummiest thing ever and it probably isn't, but because I say that every day, this is super yummy. I think if you can use some words to, that make you think, wow, I really, if I decide this is super yummy, then it absolutely is. And yeah. so it's that living in gratitude, being grateful for, because actually as humans, you'll find when people's lives are ending, they, they always say it's the little things that made them happy, their, their kid hugging them, their pet sleeping next to them, having getting into clean sheets. There's so many little things that give us immense pleasure. Mm. Living in that gratitude of where you are instead of where you could be or should be or need to be is really important. And I think children are very good at showing us that. I think your three bullet points are great. And I really hope our audience take them all to heart. So where can they find you? Where can we find you and learn to meditate with you and like you? Yeah, so everything that we talked about, the, the kids course, Ziva Online, which is our 15-day adult training, um, and it can all be found at zivameditation.com. And then there's, there's slash kids for the kids course. And I'd love to gift everyone the first three days of Ziva Online, just to see if they like my style, if they see if they like my teaching. So the first three days of our most popular course can be found at zivameditation.com slash preview. And I thought of one last tip. It's a really quick one, but I'd love to share it um, because it, you, you inspired me is that I recently, every now, every day when I wake up, when I put my feet on the ground, I just say out loud, I'm like, today is going to be a great day. And now I do it with my son. I'm like, Jack, guess what? And I go today. And he goes, it's going to be a great day. And now he like yells it out loud. And, cool. and now that he's getting a little older, I'll ask him why. You know, yeah. so he's sort of getting into the manifesting. Like, yeah. why do you think it's going to be a great day? And he's like, I'm going to dance class and I'm going to the park. And so he's like pre-planting these seeds for all the awesomeness that's on the way. How are you going to make it a great day? Because that's a really great thing for a kid. Because then they get to think, oh, I get to influence whether my day is great or not. Yeah, how can you make it a great day? And they love that because they're really good open-ended questions that allow them to understand that actually it's a choice. You know, it is a choice. Being happy doesn't sound good, but it is a choice. Your your problem is someone else's fantasy dream come true. There's someone over, hey, 
I'll take all your problems because what you're thinking, your husband leaves his underpants on the floor, your kids have got peanut butter on the sofa. I, I, I take that. I don't have a husband or kids. I've got a pristine house and I'll trade tomorrow. And we forget that. And it's always a good idea to think, is my problem someone else's fantasy? Will someone else go, hey, it's my fantasy dream come true. I, I'll take that. And so that helps you realize that happiness is a choice it, it may not seem so but it really is it, it's a choice and once you, and it sounds very Pollyanna but the more you begin to think right I'm choosing to be happy I'm choosing to be happy what happens is that when you choose to look at things differently what you're looking at becomes different because you think well yeah this is a challenge but hey what's great about it you know I I left LA um in March and then of course we can't get back in but you know my daughter actually got engaged while I was here and I thought wow I'm so glad we couldn't get back to America because I wouldn't have missed that for the world and it's been really fun house hunting with her and dress hunting and so there's always something good that happens I mean I do have a very privileged life I'm very aware of that but even when I didn't I always lived in that and people think everyone like you and I we must have the most charmed life you know we've had all kinds of things come up you know illnesses relationships not working out businesses not working out you say your dream of being on Broadway not being a dream um so it's not that we have a charmed life it's that the way we think makes our life appear charmed and, and everybody can do that it, it really is a choice check out my next video here Anyone notice that as that day comes around, they're sick? Because here's how the mind works. You say, oh my God, I volunteered to chair that meeting. I must have been out of my mind. I'd die if I've got to go on stage. I don't want to do that. And your brain's like, leave that with me. Now next Wednesday.